This is an insect we know almost nothing about. In fact, I am perhaps the first person that is filming and photographing all their life stages. And all the people watching this video will be among the first people in the entire world to witness the life cycle of this insect online. Grab your potato chips, grab your blanket. Today you are long in for a long insect story. So where do these guys come from? It's a long story, I'm afraid. Cameroon. Cameroon is a country in Africa that has 22 million hectares of tropical forest. These forests provide an important source of revenue, employment, livelihoods, ecosystem services and habitat for over 9,000 plant species, 910 bird species and 320 mammal species. Cameroon's forests are managed for both production and conservation. Areas under forest management for timber extraction make up 40% of the national forest area, while protected areas including national parks, forest reserves and hunting zones currently cover 20% of the national forest area. Cameroon's 1994 forest law was the first in Central Africa to promote community forest management as a strategy for sustainably managing forests and promoting local development. As of 2011, a total of 301 community forests covering over 1 million hectares had some form of management agreement in place. Despite efforts to promote sustainable forest management, over 3 million hectares of Cameroon's forest have been cleared since 1990, an area approximately the size of Belgium. Most of this forest loss is due to increasing pressure from other sectors, such as commercial and subsistence agriculture, mining, hydropower, and infrastructure. For example, about 73,000 hectares of palm oil plantations have been allocated in a biodiverse forest area in the southwest region, and the planet the Long Pangar Dam in the east region will flood nearly uh, 32,000 hectares of forest. Cameroon is participating in numerous international and national processes aimed at strengthening management of forests and natural resources and tackling existing land use challenges. For example, Cameroon was one of the earliest countries to sign a Voluntary Partnership Agreement or VPA through the European Union's Forest Law Enforcement, Governance and Trade FLEGT program that aims to reduce illegal logging in both domestic and international markets. In Cameroon, there are many species of insects that we know very little about and this episode is dedicated to one of them. Cameroon. Cameroon. Cameroon is an extremely important country when it comes to our environment. Because of its massive tropical rainforest. And just like any tropical rainforest in the world today, it is worth protecting and conserving. For most of the big forests that exist today face the threat of deforestation. And in these rainforests there live many animals that we don't know anything about. Including hundreds if not thousands of species of insects. And this is where I come in. Because I study butterflies and moths. And today we have one of such species. This is the Balacra carulae fascia from the tropical forest in Cameroon. 
Very little is known about this insect at all. And that's not surprising because I would say that the majority of moths in these tropical forest systems in Cameroon have completely undescribed and unknown life cycles. Therefore I am pleased to announce that a friend of mine is running the Cameroon Arc project. The Cameroon Arc project. Let me show you what it is. Let me tell you about the Cameroon Arc. First, in Cameroon, many people in local villages, they live off the land. For subsistence, bushmeat is common. Fair trade cacao beans are farmed and cassava is a staple part of the daily diet, which is supplemented by chickens and also fish caught fresh from the river, uh, called the Nyungyong. I don't know if I pronounced that right. Hundreds of thousands of pre-pupal uh, Saturnidae larvae are also farmed and harvested each year as a sustainable high-protein food source and as a significant part of the diet of people in Cameroon. 48% of the land area of Cameroon is forested, or 30 million hectares, and 47% um, of this forest is, is manages, managed and protected forest. But, however, the forest is disappearing. The current rate of loss is 1% per year. However, this rate of loss is also increasing at a rate of 10% per year on average. So the time to act is now. What the Cameroon Arc is setting out to achieve is time sensitive and potentially clonable to other parts of Africa or even other parts of the world where biodiversity is high but challenged by resource mining and stripping and sustainable locally suitable businesses are desperately needed for maximum impact. Education and a global voice is critical. The Cameroon Arc is set up as a not-for-profit organization in Cameroon. It is supported by a network of enthusiastic volunteers who are passionate about their forests and their country, as well as experts and advisors globally who are passionate about the natural world. The Cameroon Arc is an attempt to discover, describe, conserve, educate and provide, making an immediate positive impact locally, but ultimately impacting globally through its mission. The Cameroon Arc tries to conserve the rainforest in Cameroon and investigate its local wildlife, as well as thinking about potential conservation measures and sustainable relationships with said environment. The heads of the organization are Lucien and Andrew. Lucien is a native Cameroonian and has been raising and collecting insects since he was since the age of nine. Lucien is fluent in French and acts as a coordinator of a network of volunteers, including collectors, butterfly and moth raisers, entomologists and guides. The site is based immediately at their scent to a 50 hectare area of my mixed primary and secondary growth forest in the Obaut village. Lucien is originally from another village, but he lives in Obaut and Yuande with his wife and five children. Then there is Andrew Spicer, the UK coordinator and charity director. Andrew has a passion for the natural world and he has a professional background in scientific research, technology and innovation development. He is a director of Spicer Consulting Limited and the CEO of Algenuity, who are both based in Bedfordshire in the UK with a total staff count of about 45. Andrew acts as the charity director for the Cameroon Arc in the United Kingdom, where his main role is to act uh, in mentoring and guidance of the project. He has run successful conservation projects in the USA and has raised Saturnidae Day since he was 13 years old. Andrew lives in the UK and has five children too. And then there is the extended team. You see, there is also an extended team of experts and advisors worldwide providing a knowledge base drawn from an extended network of UK, 
Europe, USA and Central American butterfly and moth professionals and enthusiasts. Some of these advisors and experts include Ian Smith, Matt Simmons, Robin Allen, Gary Saunders, Mario Posta and uh, Bart Coppens. Hmm, well it's, it's right there on their website. That name sounds familiar, doesn't it? This guy seems unusually attractive for an entomologist. I wonder what his workout routine is, huh? Okay, I'm sorry. The Cameroon Arc supports sustainable ecotourism, increase the quality of life for people in Cameroon by developing it, protecting the local ecosystem and researching local species. That's right. And the eggs of this moth came from Cameroon through the Cameroon Arc project. And I am glad that I am working together with them. It is because of the Cameroon Arc project also that I have been able to obtain material such as eggs and cocoons of many moth species from Africa. It is a win-win situation. I get to breed the insect, I get to find out their life cycles, which were in many cases previously unknown to science. I get to find out some of their development rates, their ecology, the plants they like to eat, how long it takes them to develop, etc. And by doing so, I frequently obtain pictures of caterpillars, of butterflies and moths that were not documented before. And by doing this with a lot of species in the long term, this may actually help increase our chances of studying these animals in the wild and even conserving them if we need to. Because how can you protect an insect if we don't know anything about its biology, if we don't know what the caterpillars look like, how they live, what they eat, etc. Of course it would be a little bit better if I got to study them in the wild, but I live in the Netherlands and not in Africa. And I think this project is really wonderful. And I am very proud that it is one of my friends running this project. So Mr. Andrew, if you are watching this, you are doing good work. And I just wanted to say this before starting this episode. Because before I made this YouTube video, more or less, nothing was known about the life cycle of this species. And what you are about to watch today in this video is witnessing for the first time the life cycle of this moth species. It was not, in, not before in any book, on any website, in any video. The life cycle of this moth here was totally undocumented. And it's only because of the collaboration with the Cameroon Arc Conservation Project that we today are able to witness the life cycle of this beautiful and magnificent insect to look at it. So without further ado, thank you all very much for watching. Thank you Cameroon Arc. I hope we can do many more collaborations in the future. And let's start the intro. Balakra. What are Balakra? 
Balakra is a genus of tiger moths from Africa. And not too much is known about them. So I'm going to read them in this episode of Moth Cycles. This will be a refreshing change from all the silk moths. Silk moth this, silk moth that, Saturnidae this, Saturnidae that, blah 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 blah. I've been obsessed with silk moth lately, we've given them too much attention. My YouTube channel isn't about silk moths, it's about all moths. So I've decided I'm going to breed some more hawk moth species, I'm going to breed more tussock moths. Any suggestions? Write it in the comments and maybe I can read it for you. But this video is going to be about Balakra and here I have some eggs. They came from Cameroon from Africa and apparently they eat almost everything including bramble, dandelion, many small weeds like even clover and willow. So let's get started. So uh, my Balakra video really starts with this, um, eggs, although these eggs are already hatching. When I open it, can you see all the baby caterpillars? You probably need a close-up of this to uh, fully appreciate it, what's going on here. Here are the babies. Are they not super cute? Many of them were hatching from their eggs at once. But this video is going to start with the obvious thing. I'm going to... Well, it's actually not as easy as it looks, but I have to take all these eggs out. Just gonna go do it like this. Place them in a nice rearing container. Not even going to bother harvest them. As you can see here is a second plate of eggs. Uh, the eggs have been laid for some reason on a piece of paper, which is actually for me very convenient right now. Oh, I have to be careful here with these uh, pliers, because if I squeeze too hard, I may crush the eggs. There you go. That's the baby balakras. Yes, I like saying balakra, it's an unusual word. So this is sufficient for now. All we have to do is add some dandelion leaves, which is the favorite of many tiger moths, and of course, close the container and wait for a few days. Okay, so far so good. What you wanna do is close the lid, and wait for a day or two for the caterpillars to start feeding by their own. Um, it's very hard to make nice to show content right now because the caterpillars are so small. I need a special camera to zoom in uh, with them. I can't even use this camera to get closer than this and get a nice image. So they'll have to grow to a decent size but I will monitor them every day and show you the process. Uh, the moth should be quite beautiful. The female is greyish and the males have bright red and orange accent. I think the species could be Balacra Preussi, but we will see when they grow up. This is a completely random tiger moth from the middle of nowhere that no people usually breed. It's quite unusual for me to breed this. Okay, Balacra breeding, day number three, and I found out something new. I added one leaf of sweet gum liquid umber and they really like it. Wanna see? Sweet gum or liquid umber is a useful plant if you want to raise moths yourself. It's very rich in sugars and nutrients and a lot of tiger moths will feed on it in captivity. Here you can observe the small caterpillars running around. This is probably the first time anyone is going to witness the life cycle of this species up close. In a few days time they shed their skin to the second instars. And those are more greyish and the hairy ones that you can see right here. Of course you want to see. Let's take that lid off again, just to take a peek inside. Oh my god. 
Look at this leaf and how many caterpillars are on it. They seem to prefer it above dandelion. Really a lot. What a huge, excellent result. Just look at all these super small little caterpillars. It's amazing to see. Amazing. Sadly, these guys are still very small. So I'm gonna close the container as fast as I can and leave them alone. But this looks very promising. Okay guys, Balakra update. I filled the container with paper towels. Why was that? Well, the dandelion, I was feeding them, it has a lot of moisture in it, you know, and it made the container very wet. I didn't really like this, so I added a lot of paper, a lot of paper towel, so it will absorb this moisture as a buffer. Anyway, um, I think they're growing well. Let's, let's take a look inside. It's uh, been about one week now since they hatched, so... Uh, and now, some behavioral observation of this mysterious species. The caterpillars of this Balaka species seem to be mainly nocturnal. And when they are confronted with disturbance or daylight, they scatter and hide under objects and groups. It seems they have gregarious behaviors. This was hard to film, because the group of caterpillars settles together in a dark place during the day, but when disturbed, they run away in all directions in a big panic. I added paper towels, which they seem to appreciate. The caterpillars of this species are more ground dwelling or surface dwelling and prefer to have objects to climb on and to hide below. Oh my, finally, so it's you and me together in one bed, I've, uh, I've waited so long for this, it can only mean one thing right, are you thinking what I'm thinking? Of course we are going to look at the caterpillars to see the progress of our African tiger moth, the uh, Balakra. Let's make some space here. Some light. <coughs> Let's take a look at our progress. Instar number three. At least this is what I think they are. The caterpillars seem to have become bigger and hairier. Hmm, reminds me of myself. They are still as hyperactive uh, when they are disturbed. And here you can see a gathering of some social caterpillars hidden within the paper towel inside their containers. Behavior that is quite interesting if you ask me. I theorize that in their habitat during the day they mostly hide under objects such as rocks or leaf litter only to disperse and feed at night.
deep note that little is known about the ecology of this species in the wild, so these are all just my speculations based on my observations in captivity. Eventually the caterpillars kept eating all the food I added in one single day, which was a sign I had to upgrade them to a bigger box. Here you see a plastic fauna box. These boxes are very useful for raising many silk moths and tiger moths. I added paper towels to, as, uh, to absorb excess moisture, make it easy to clean and give them something to hide in, which they seem to like. Later, I added plants such as dandelion, so the larva could eat undisturbed. And then finally, I put them one by one in the box. As you can see, this piece is quite energetic. Once disturbed, the caterpillars take quite a while to settle down and become calm again. And here is the third instar. Please note that this is the first time we are going to see the life cycle of this insect ever. So nobody actually knows what these are going to look like once they grow up. But one thing is for sure, they are hairy. Hairy caterpillars are usual for tiger moths, however. Slowly, they grew into instar number four. Now here is a fun fact. Did you know that there are over 30 species of Balakra in Africa? Depending on their taxonomic status, perhaps there is even up to 40 species of them. And we know very, very little about the life history of these Balakra species. They come in many colors, from white to black to orange and red. For severely understudied moths, to me, their biology is quite fascinating. I didn't know what species this was at the moment uh, that I began to raise them, so I had no clue what to expect or how to raise them to moths. I just followed my instinct and so far it seemed to have worked. Now I want to remind you all that YouTube is not very scientific. For me, YouTube is just entertainment and a side job that I have. The really important information I am gathering from this will be published, published later on various websites and perhaps in articles describing their phonistics. But whenever I do projects like this, not only do I like to breed and observe them in captivity, it's a good bonus if I can turn it into entertaining uh, content as well. Not a lot of people who work with insects have the privilege of also being in the spotlight the way I am. And I will use it to my advantage by showing people species they have never even heard of, or to give them an appreciation for them and the many forgotten pre uh, creatures that uh, exist on our planet.
Now eventually their enclosure needed more food and I included it in the form of cut bramble pieces in a can of water. There you go, fresh food for all. Just a little bit of bramble leaves, okay. Caterpillars like to drink sometimes, so I spray them with water, considering their setup can be quite dry, especially in winter, when we have the radiator on in our houses to keep warm, it can severely dry out the air. Um, what's interesting is they seem to have eaten all the bramble, there's not a single leaf left on it. The caterpillars seem to grow quite well in this setup and quickly grew larger once again. Observing them was truly fascinating. I can only imagine how they would behave in the wild. I suspect that they are ground dwelling during the day while they climb up into trees and shrubs at night. I'm saying this because in captivity during the day they were mainly hiding in the paper towels, feeding on some of the leaf litter there, while I was mo mostly at night that they emerged and started feeding on the bramble leaves. However, as they were growing bigger, they kept running out of food more frequently, which was a problem for me. I had to replace the food almost daily, which was bothersome. I had to come up with something new. This is when I, after checking the health of our larvae, decided to put them in two and not just one. 
containers. So this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to divide the caterpillars not in one but in two containers. Uh, why? Because I think one container is too much for all these caterpillars now, right now. And I noticed that some of them are even shedding their damn skins again. So that means we have one more instar to grow. The species is much bigger than I expected and I have to make two boxes, otherwise they are overcrowded if they get bigger. Now in these boxes they were growing quite well for a while, but the larva grew even bigger. So instead I had to come up with something even bigger. And after a while I had figured it out. So a little bit later. Welcome to my bed. That's right. There's a good chance that if you are a fan of me, that you and me will end up in bed. <laughs> Anyways. I prepared a new system to raise the balakra because the caterpillars of balakra were eating so much leaves every time I kept feeding them in one day all the leaves were gone and eaten and I got tired of that I think they need a final upgrade to the huge cage here behind me and as you can see there's a large big rearing cage filled with bramble leaf. Now this should definitely be more than enough for our little caterpillars. So let's hope that this will do the balakra well. I'm going to add them in here. Hey, hello everyone, this is my breakfast. Just kidding, these are the balakra that I've been raising. I've gathered them together for a picture. And I'm about to put them in our new house that I made. So let's continue with that. I can't believe I'm filming all of this on my bed. It's actually not a good idea from a hygiene perspective to put your animals on your bed but um, it's winter and it's very dark outside and I cannot film outside anymore and the other uh, rooms in my house are poorly illuminated so I don't have a solution so for now in winter I will film here I guess just hope that these toxic hairs don't end up in my bed but here they are going to go into their new house Whoop. Wow, they're really spilling into the into the container there. No, get inside. Get inside. Not outside of the cage. Thank you very much. I don't want caterpillars in my bed. That's dirty. I love insects, but it's not a good idea. Oh, no, no, no. Uh-oh. I should have figured out that they're going to go everywhere. No, get in. Not where I sleep, okay. There you go. Come on, guys. Is it all of them? Yay, we did it! Hey! Wow, is that you? Wow, you've, grow you, you've become so attractive. Hey, would you mind it if you and me had a date? I'm serious. You look so good today, it's amazing. Arch, not in front of the fans, okay. Just... Just message me on Instagram or something. So, uh, <coughs> oh yeah, what was I doing? I forgot, I was checking my caterpillars of Balakra. That is right, the Balakra. So let's see how they are doing. Because I just put them in this massive cage here and now we're going to see how they are growing.
a little bit later. In their new setup, they seem to be much more comfortable and I finally could provide them adequate food. Being a caterpillar daddy isn't easy since they can strip down insanely large chunks of plants in a very short time. It is important to add enough food so they do not run out. The caterpillars in this stage were also urticating. Touching them had mildly venomous effects, causing itching and minor rashes, but nothing too serious. Still, I was a little bit careful. What's up guys, here a funny behavioral update. Cage seems to be almost empty. It is currently January and I started raising these guys in October. So where are all of them? That's funny. Look at this. I don't know if you can see it, but if we shake this... What? These are the caterpillars. So, uh, some of you will be asking Bart, why do you shake all of them out at Harshly? Well, just to show you how these guys hide during the day and uh, come out at night to feed. They really need obstacles to hide in. And uh, the actual reason that I was shaking all of the caterpillars out of the, out of the, well, thing that they were sitting in is because I was cleaning their cage because they like a, a clean, healthy cage. So this is good for them. Just in case you were wondering, because I always get these uh, smelly, stinking, and they're all rights activist people commenting on my videos. Why are you shaking them that violently? Okay, if you care about animals, that's great. Actually, I'm on your side. I also care about animals. But, uh... Bothers me when people who have no clue about insects come to my channel and say stuff like that. You're picking the fight with the wrong guy. Despite that, it looks like they're growing excellently well. So, that's... Uh, I'm happy. Here we go, back into the new cage with fresh brambles. Whee! Have fun guys, have fun. Wow, it's hard to believe that this is true, but it is true. This caterpillar just shed its skin again, which means my caterpillars are not fully grown. And I've been raising them for four months now. Four months. And these guys are also about to shed their skins. There's even one more instar to go. It may even take over five months to raise these guys. Wow. Incredible. It's taking so long. Now let me show you their feeding behavior. Now it's dark, but let me turn the light on. Boom! There they are. This is one example of how they behave at night. Feeding together in small groups of 2 to 10 individuals. I just thought it was interesting to show.
Much to my surprise and desperation, they just kept growing. Surely, these are one of my biggest tiger moth cap uh, caterpillars that I have witnessed so far. It was also one of my longest rearings, with the caterpillars being six months old now. And still growing larger. Nothing seemed to be able to stop these guys, but I just kept going and going. I was starting to hope that they would pupate soon. Raising the same caterpillars for six months, it gets quite tiresome. Now this is really incredible. I received these moths in October as eggs and currently it is March and I think they may even make it to April. So it will take me about six months or half a year to raise these guys. And the crazy thing is they're going to shed their skins once again. I can't believe it. The final rearing may take like, I don't know, seven months and then they will just pupate. So maybe it will take them more time to turn into moths. What an incredibly slow growing species, but I still have good results. So nothing seems wrong. They're just really slow, like really slow. Wow. Oh, uh, if you had any further complaints, just look at how healthy and well fed these guys are, okay? Trust me when I say that I am experienced when it comes to caterpillars. And what is fascinating is how absolutely huge these guys were for tiger moths. Most Arctinae that I raise are not nearly this size. I thought they would be fully grown by now, but once again it seems I was proven wrong. <clears throat> Well, here they go again. I just cleaned their container again. They have fresh food, fresh everything. And these guys are really, I don't know, prolific, very strong in captivity, but so darn slow. It's uh, really, really interesting. Now let's add some more of the paper rolls here that they like to hide in during the day. So, what a weird species, man. Very interesting though. Hello guys, I just found something that made me extremely happy. Yo. You see, um, this rearing is uh, without any, any sense of irony, is one of the longest rearings that I ever had in my career. And... Um, the caterpillars are now seven months old. Okay, let that sink in. I obtained them in October, in late uh, autumn. And together me and these caterpillars went from autumn to winter to, to spring. Take a look, the flowers are growing back in the grass right now. The sun is shining. This rearing here, it, uh, seven months, that's, how, that's over half a year, boys. And um, it took a lot of my patience. Um, I'm used to raising caterpillars who take their time. Sometimes I've raised leopard moths that take like four months. Or uh, like the Gonomatas, the giant leopard moths from Africa, they usually take like three months to uh, grow. And, uh, and that already takes a lot of patience. But seven months? Seven months? That's unheard of. But I did find something, guys. Take a look. Here is an, an 
cardboard roll it's almost empty as you can see but there's something in the middle which I want to show you so I'm just going to prime my finger in here for a second which is a bit unprofessional but take a look Woohoo! I'm so happy look this is the first first pupa of Balaka Percy and when you finally get that pupa from your caterpillars, it's always a glorious moment. It always gives you some happiness. And like, yes, I made it. I can finally see the moths soon. However, in this case, I am extra happy. I am double happy. Why? Because I did so much time, so much effort into this single species. It's incredible. Look at that. And it's a very big pupa. Um, I've raised some of the biggest tiger moths in the world, such as this Schema Hawardi, and Arias Galactina. Now those are not the biggest in the world, but among the biggest. And it's surprising to see how big the pupa of Balakra Pricey is in comparison. It just took me by surprise. I thought this was a small species, but it's for a tiger moth, this dude is a giant. And well, that is strange because their wingspan, as far as I know, is not is not that big. But I guess this size, this piece is really fat. Like it has a very big body size. Very interesting. And this is pupa number one. All right. And um, upon careful inspection, we discover that well, the rest of the caterpillars are are still just that. They are still caterpillars, as you can see. So I'm not. We are seven months in, and I am not, not even nearly finished. Here's all the caterpillars. Look at them being pooping, stinging hairy bastards. However, it means that uh, there was some good news. Um, we have one pupa, and when there is one, there will be more soon. So I hope that uh, within a few weeks, I'm finally going to get all these pupa. I really hope that I will. Like, like guys, just look at how big these are. So big. For a tiger moth, this is huge. This must be a record for me. And I'm surprised. I thought these guys were going to be like Arctiakaya, the, the garden tiger or something. But this is a, a monster. And I have 30 of them. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Guys, you guys, I can't believe it. Among the caterpillars and the and the poop, I guess. I just I just found another pupa. It's fresh. Didn't even make cocoon. So this brings our pupa number two. Well look. Two pupa. Woohoo! These spines are toxic spines. And touching them does indeed hurt. Luckily for me, they did not seem dangerous. Although the splinters are very sharp and itchy as well. I can totally imagine how some types of predators, like birds or small rodents, will have a difficult time swallowing or digesting these guys. It is not uncommon for tiger moths to have spines like these though. When touched, they will break off just like the spines of a porcupine and this will hurt and bother predators that harass them.
So now the caterpillars are fully grown. After finding our first pupa, it was only a matter of time before I would be able to find more pupa. There we are! Some more fat, round and healthy pupa. Finally, after more than seven months of raising caterpillars, I'm about to show you a moth. The pupa that I harvested from the big caterpillar cage were eventually stored inside a small plastic container that had paper towels on the bottom and sides. This setup works for um, most species of tiger moths. Eventually, the amount of pupa began to increase and every day I had a small new handful of them. And then the waiting game began. Oh my god, there it is, an empty pupal shell. Something must have crawled out. A moth! We did it! The first moth hatched and it's looking surprisingly colorful. Now the specimen spent about 15 minutes pumping up its wings, which were at first small and completely shriveled. By pumping its body fluid into the wings, they gain their shape and harden, but this process takes time and patience. And now finally we can ID the species as a Balacra cairulae fascia. Reportedly it is found in Angola, Cameroon, the Central African Republic, Congo, the Democratic, Democratic Republic of Congo, Equatorial Guinea, Gabon, Ghana, Guinea, the Ivory Coast, Liberia, Nigeria, Sierra Leone, Tanzania, Togo, Uganda and perhaps even more countries. They are part of the Tiretini, a special group of tiger moths from Africa. Very interesting to notice is that it was some type of wasp mimicry that was going on here, especially on the abdomen. I was really happy to see this super interesting and colorful species of insect. The fact that I was able to complete its life cycle on YouTube is honestly a marvel to me. The first specimen did appear to be a male. These moths do not feed and only live for one to two weeks time since they have no functioning mouth parts at all. In Africa there's many species of Balacra, over 30 of them last time I checked and some of these species um, uh, some of these species pictures of caterpillars and females are hard to find or simply don't exist. Therefore, projects like mine, they actually help to decipher the biology um, of these creatures better. Which benefits our knowledge of them and helps us conserve them if we need to.
Eventually more males hatched. Males tend to hatch first, before the females do, because of their smaller body size. And they need a shorter development time. The moth seemed quite healthy and active and I was happy to have raised so many moths in good condition. And the colors they were just like art. Eventually more and more just kept hatching. Sadly though, these males are short-lived and many started to die soon. They run out of energy after about one week. Good thing that many of them were hatching. Uh, however, I did start to get curious about the female. What would she look like? I wonder because the female pupa looked much more bigger than the male. Excellent news everyone. Amazing news everyone. I see a female has just hatched and I am stunned. Look at how big she is. Here we see another male who hatched and here we see the female. Let's take a look at this magnificent creature. Oh my gosh. Come here you super cutie. Oh my gosh. Wow. Here we have the first look at the female. And I'm not going to lie. This creature looks super amazing. Let's see if we can take a look at this abdomen right here. <gasps> Oh my god, look at those colors! It's incredible! Look at that metallic blue! It's so beautiful! Like a gemstone! Wow! Look at that! Incredible! I've never seen something like this! What a magnificent creature! Well, and there she is. I'm not going to lie when I say this is the best looking female I have ever seen in my life. <coughs> when it comes to insects, of course. The females of this moth are stunning and have iridescent blue metallic scales between the segments of their abdomens. They are quite conspicuous and rather seem to advertise the fact that they may seem unpalatable to predators. Although without a chemical test, this is merely my speculations. Clearly though, their colors may ward off predators. However, unlike the males of this species, females are much bigger, they are very plump, they struggle to fly in general because of their weight, and they seem to lay many many eggs, like their, their huge abdomens, they lay hundreds of eggs, probably to compensate for the high mortality rate of the caterpillars. It definitely seemed like some sort of aposematism was there. Which I can only speculate about because I don't have the chemical uh, equipment to confirm this. But looking at the males and females patterns, I do suspect there may be some degree of unpalatability to them. But we don't know. Definitely very fascinating and big females however. So the last step of, of completing this life cycle would be to pair them, right? But sadly this didn't happen. Whatever it is that I tried, 
My males and females did not want to pair. It seems there was no copulation. Uh, that was a little bit disappointing because it would be cool if I could finish the video with a second generation coming. But this does not always happen, especially if you study moth species of which very little is known about. And it can be complicated to figure out what it is that they need to reproduce in captivity. And I've gotten very far, I must say, but I wasn't able to complete the pairing. I have a theory about why, however, but I will talk to you about this in the review section of my Moth Cycles video. But for now you will just have to remember the fact that they did indeed lay many eggs. But I, 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 I took some of these eggs but they never hatched and I kept them for a while but it was clear to me that they were infertile so I guess that that's where the bloodline ends uh, eventually the moths died after about two weeks and it was the end of my content, the end of my project I gathered a lot of information, I gathered a lot of data a lot of new information and don't let people tell you that YouTube is worthless because in cases like this YouTube can actually benefit the environment. It can benefit our knowledge of animals and nature. <laughs> you just have to watch channels like these and not Jake Paul, okay? Or Nicado Avocado. <laughs> sorry, sorry. Anyway, let's continue. And now it is time for the review. If you are a fan of my channel and you watch the other episodes of Moth Cycles, you know that after every episode, I like to have a little bit of a review where we can talk about what happened. Why? Because I think that's interesting. And I also have to give myself a little rating. It's uh, a bit trivial, but uh, it's, it's nice to do anyways. First of all, the result was really good. This moth, as far as I know, was not raised by anyone else so far. I've tried to read a lot of books, a lot of articles, and I couldn't find any reference to the life cycle of this insect. I'm not sure if I am the first, but I may very well be the first person to raise this moth, ever. So for you viewers, this, this YouTube episode is also kind of special. Because I don't think you will see life cycles of uh, species like this anywhere else. In no other book, no other website, no other YouTube channel. And it was challenging because when I got the eggs, I didn't know what species it was going to be. And I didn't know what they were going to eat. I didn't know how to take care of them. So I just followed my in instinct. A little bit I followed my instinct. And it paid off. We had very little losses. This was one of my most difficult, uh, well, it wasn't difficult, but one of my longest rearings. Uh, I started raising these caterpillars in October. And they pupated in, well, I think it was March. That's incredible, it's over half a year. This is definitely the record for my longest rearing ever. Ever. So, um... But I cannot give myself a perfect rating, because uh, here we have the adult moths. They laid a lot of eggs, but they did not pair. I kept the eggs in here. Turns out all the eggs are infertile, so the bloodline ends here. There will be no babies. I uh, raised uh, these moths basically from, uh, from egg. Yep, from egg to moth and I completed that cycle but I didn't continue a second generation because they didn't have any offspring so the bloodline dies here with me that's it that's the end of this species in captivity and so because of that I cannot give myself a perfect rating but we did have very little losses 
with a species that almost nothing is known about. So I say that's quite good, right? I mean, it sucks that they didn't pair, they didn't make any babies. That would have been perfect, but they didn't. But okay, I'm gonna give myself an 8 out of 10. So why does these moths not pair? Hmm. I don't know, but I do have a theory about why they don't pair. Let me show you what I think is going on and why they did not make any babies. So why did my moths not pair? Well, I don't know, because if I knew, I would have been able to pair them. But I do have a theory. And for this theory, to illustrate, I am going to take one scientific study. It is called Precopulatory Sexual Interaction in an Arctic Moth, Utetaisa ornatrix, Role of a Pheromone Derived from di Dietary uh, Alkaloids. Published in Behavioral Ecology and Sociobiology, Volume 9, pages 227-235, in 1981. Now, the abstract is as follows. The males of the Utetaisa ornatrix have a pair of brush-like glandular structures called the choremata, which they avert from the abdomen during close-range precopulatory interaction with the female. Males experimentally deprived of choremata are less acceptable to females. The principal chemical associated with the choremata, identified as a pyridozine hydroxydanidal, uh, I hope I pronounced that right, has um, a proven pheromonal role. Males raised under conditions where they fail to produce any hydroxydanidal um, are also less likely to succeed in courtship. And the compound itself, um, as is isomer, is capable of inducing the principal receptive response, wing raising of the female. Evidence is presented indicating that Utetaisa derive hydroxydanidal from defensive pyrolizidine alkaloids. I'm so sorry, I'm not a native English speaker. It's difficult if you have a thick Dutch accent to say pyrolizidine. Um, anyway, the evidence is presented that uh, the caterpillars of this species derive pyrolizidine alkaloids that they sequester from their larval food plant, which is Crotillaria. And it is proposed that in addition to signaling um, male presence to the female, hydroxydanidal may provide the means whereby the female assesses the alkaloid content of the male and therefore his degree of chemical protectedness. The argument is made that such pheromonal assessment of defensive capacity may occur also in other insects, including danite butterflies, many of which share with Ititaisa a dependence on pyrolizine alkaloids for sex pheromone production. So what does this mean? Now those of you who are literate in uh, organic chemistry and pheromone communication and the pairing rituals of arctids will know where this is going. But there's also a few of you who are not on this level, so I will explain it very uh, basically to you on, a, on an easy level, using e easy language for you. Uh, I'm, I'm not so fluent in English myself and I struggle to find the correct terms sometimes. Uh, my native language is Dutch, but I hope I can explain this to you. So this is how it works. This Utetaisa ornatrix is a toxic moth, right? It is um, unpalatable. Predators like to avoid this species. And that's why it's so brightly colored. And that's because it's chemically protected. Um, now the funny thing is that these uh, chemicals that protect the insect, which are the alkaloids, the pyrolizidine alkaloids, they don't produce this toxin themselves. They more or less steal it from their host plant. See, this is Crotalaria, and Crotalaria is um, the favorite food plant of the caterpillars of this moth. And Crotalaria contains chemicals 
toxins basically that protect it. However, these uh, caterpillars of this moth that eat the crotalaria, they are more or less immune to this toxin. But not only are they immune to it, they store it inside their bodies. And this is a process that is called sequestration. Now by sequestering these uh, chemicals inside their bodies, in turn, these caterpillars become toxic, just like their food plant. And so does the moth, when these caterpillars turn into a moth. So you could say, basically, that the chemical protection that this species enjoys is directly derived from its diet, from its food plant. These alkaloids that it basically absorbs into its fat tissues and permanently chemically protect the insect itself from any predators. That sounds reasonable, right? That's easy to understand. But we are not yet coming to the conclusion of my story. The thing is that being chemically protected gives the insect an advantage. Therefore, individuals who have sequestered a higher amount of toxins will have a greater fitness than those who don't. Think about it. One caterpillar that had many alkaloids in his diet will have many of these toxins in his body and will, be, will have stronger protection against predators. That makes sense. So also, technically speaking, an individual that sequestered many toxins should be more attractive to a partner. And this is the clue, this is the essence of my story because these moths uh, produce pheromones. Pheromones are basically um, volatile compounds. Pheromones are a chemical uh, which is basically a smell that at attracts a partner, right? And these uh, moths produce these pheromones directly from uh, compounds derived from the toxins that they sequester inside their bodies. So to explain it even more simply, these moths make their pheromones from the toxins that protect them. And the more toxins they have in their diet, the more attractive they will be to a partner. Do you get where this is going? That also means that if they are deprived of these toxins in their diet, partners will not be interested in pairing with them. For, uh, because of some... Uh, You see, an individual that is completely deprived of toxins will not be able to produce any pheromones at all and is effectively sterile. And this can happen in captivity. In some cases, when we raise moths in captivity and we give them a diet of plants that are not really their native host plant, sometimes you can produce healthy adults that are effectively sterile because they do not produce any pheromone. Since they never had any of the appropriate phytochemicals they need to produce pheromones. Now hydroxydanidal is called a precursor compound. It is the compound that is used to biosynthesize uh, pheromones in many species of tiger moths. Not all of them, but in many of them. And this is a very, um, if you think about it, it's very smart because this way the amount of pheromone they produce is directly related to the amount of toxins they have eaten. And the more toxic the individual is, the more attractive it will be since it will be producing more pheromones and thus it will be easier for it to find a partner. And this creates a natural selection in which the females uh, basically try to pair with the most toxic males since they, so they, these are the most attractive ones because they have the best defenses, they have the strongest fitness, right? Think about it like that. And my theory is that in maybe when I was raising my balaka on host plants that are definitely not very native to uh, Cameroon, such as Bramble and Dandelion, may have been missing certain compounds in their diet that may have made it um, impossible for them to synthesize these pheromones. That's something to think about, isn't it? Now, this is all just speculation, okay? 
it could be something else. Maybe they didn't like the temperature. Maybe they didn't like the degree of light that I gave them. Maybe they need more humidity. But when I look at these balaka, it does seem they have some type of aposematism to them. And personally, I do not know their native food plants. It could very well be that in Cameroon, they specifically seek out certain host plants that uh, contain toxic compounds they can sequester and use as pheromone precursor um, chemicals, basically. Pheromone precursor compounds, I should say. Um, I theorized that if it was possible to find the uh, native food plant of this species somehow in the wild, then it would become possible to breed them in captivity and pairing should be very easy in that case. But for that we will have to do studies in the wild, not in captivity. Because I am breeding them indoors and it's hard to speculate about the biology of a species if you've breed them in your bedroom and never seen them in the wild. So uh, maybe someday if my channel grows really big I will have enough budget to travel the world and uh, investigate things like this but for now I don't so you have to do with my theory here thank you is this true could they be missing a precursor compound for their pheromone production it could be maybe they are missing certain phytochemicals in their diet they need to produce the pheromones that make them attractive to partners it happens it's a very valid theory, but the main problem is uh, I can't find out why, because I'm just a hobbyist, I'm just a bored guy with a camera. I don't have the money for fancy equipment and chemical tests. I would do them if, if, I, if I could, but I can't. Maybe someday when this channel grows bigger it will be possible. Oh sorry, I'm sweating a little, uh, it's a bit, I don't know, it's very humid and warm right now in the Netherlands. But there is some good news. Uh, I got very interested in this group. Um, and I have here this book now. See it? It's the Tiretini of Africa. What are the Tiretini? Well, the Tiretini are the... See, this looks like my moth, doesn't it? This is the group of moths, the special group of tiger moths that you can find in Africa. That the genus Balacra belongs to. These type of tiger moths, there's basically a whole special group of tiger moths that live in Africa. Many of them have this typical uh, slender, almost a wasp-like shape. And they come in many sizes and colors. And I really want to study them a little bit better. Um, I have to thank you, by the way. My YouTube channel is demonetized. I don't make money from making videos. But I do get a lot of donations from you, my viewers. And because of that, I can afford to get equipment like this that allows me to study the biology a little bit better. And because of that, I have access to literature. So my brains, they thank you. I have a lot of new knowledge because of you. And, um, I can show you. I will make a special episode about this book later when I, when I read it a little. But here we can see a lot of type specimens of the Tiretini. Uh, I think this is Metarctia, yeah, it's not Balaka, it's the Metarctia. But uh, we can, uh, oh yeah, let's see. This is, uh, can you see it? These are all Balakra species. Can you see them? That's how many Balakra species exist. And that's not even all of them. So it's very, very diverse here. On the other page it continues, can you see it? Can you see it? Just some examples of Balakra species. So this the species in this video that you saw today in this video is um, one of the many species that exist of Balakra. And as you could see in a the book, there's many of them. See, so uh, I have some reading to do. Uh, maybe I can gain new knowledge thanks to you. This was a very unique episode. I want to like thank the Cameroon Art Project. Uh, thank you so much for helping me, Andrew. Hope you're doing you're doing really good work. If I had more time and money, I would I would visit the project in Africa. I would help out. Uh, maybe it's gonna happen someday if I get more subscribers and uh, more sponsors. 
I can co totally see myself having the budget to travel and film some uh, very cool species for you in Africa and also show you some conservation work. You know, it would be great if I were to become a YouTuber that can spread some positivity of the environment too. Not just moths in captivity, but also the environment where they live and uh, conservation projects and stuff like that it would be amazing. I would love to make a positive impact for these animals. So, um, uh, I hope you enjoyed it as well. The score I give myself is an 8 out of 10. So, uh, that's great. <laughs> and now uh, we will go to the... Uh, I will have later have a preview to show you in the e-bagging part. Let's continue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, I'm working on many videos behind the scenes. I'm not kidding. I am working on many videos behind the scenes, but just like this video here, I began making this video uh, almost a year ago and it's finished today. I mean, can you see the difference in the video that in the beginning of the video, my hair is short. I don't have a beard. Oh wow, this needs to be cut. And during the production of this video, I grew my hair out. I even got a beard. That's how long it took for me to make this. You have to understand. And I'm gonna end this also with a preview. And in the preview you can see some of the videos I'm working on. Uh, they're going to be uploaded maybe tomorrow, maybe next week, maybe next month, maybe next year. Because some of them take a lot of time. Just to give you a small teaser of what is to come in the future. It gives you a good reason to subscribe to my channel. Uh, meanwhile, you can watch some of my older videos. I have over 900 videos of insects and while I am working on making new videos, I expect you to go and watch some of the older ones. So uh, hey, cheers guys, see you later. Balakra. We need your help. Africa has many super amazing species of butterflies and moths. And here is one of them. This one is called the African moon moth, Archema mimosa. The insects of Africa are worth preserving, worth studying and worth fighting for. But unfortunately, they are threatened. Most tropical ecosystems in the world are under attack by deforestation, by mining, by development, by so many threats. And I wish to give these insects a good future, to conserve them, to learn about them. Sadly, this is not happening. And I am very worried about the future. You see, these moths, they have one fatal flaw. They are excellent survivals survivalists they are beautiful they are fascinating but they don't have a mouth and they don't have a voice they are also very underappreciated animals how many people in the world are fighting to conserve rhinos tigers lions it's a lot more people than those who are willing to fight for insects but the truth is, insects are the most important animals on our planet. Without insects, there would be no other animals. Since they are at the bottom of the food chain and support all the other life on top of it. And I like to believe that my channel helps insects in several ways and their conservation. You see, the life cycle of many butterflies and moths is unknown to science. And let me ask you a question, my dear viewer. How can you protect, how can you preserve an animal if we know nothing about its life cycle? How can you protect an animal if you don't know what it eats? How can you not protect an animal if you don't know how they live? If they live in the trees, if they dwell on the floor, what kind of plants the caterpillars eat, how long it takes them to develop, when do they fly? In the rainy season? In the dry season? What habitat do they prefer? And by breeding moths in captivity, I get a lot of enjoyment. But it's not just enjoyment that I get.
I also get knowledge. I reveal the life cycles of many insects that have not been studied very well by science. And by doing so, indirectly, this channel and my work is contributing to their survival. And that's at least that's what I like to believe, because it all makes sense. It's not rocket science, so moths are easy to breed, but it's still important work that nobody else is doing. So you guys are thinking, yay, Bart, you have a lot of subscribers. That's the end of the story, right? It's not. See, here is the problem. My YouTube channel is completely and permanently demonetized. If I upload a video, and my videos take a lot of work, they take months and months of work and preparation, but when I upload them I get zero dollars in return. I get nothing for it. And that's alright, because YouTube for me is a passion project. I really like talking about the animals that I care about, I like showing them to you, I like educating people about them. But it does make it very difficult to run such a big show about insects online that has over 10,000 subscribers who watch it today. Because these uh, videos make a lot of time, uh, take a lot of time, take a lot of effort, take a lot of money, preparation. Therefore, my dear viewers, I'm going to ask you if you are willing and able to please consider contributing financially to my channel. There are several ways you can do it. One is Patreon. Patreon is a subscription-based crowdfunding platform where you can basically choose a small amount to donate every month. But for those who don't want to be obligated to a monthly subscription, you can also send single pay uh, payments via PayPal, via LiberaPay, which are electronic payment systems. Now, I don't like begging for donations online. I think it's a little bit humiliating that someone like me has to beg for donations. But it seems that on YouTube there is no place for content creators like me. I'm not exactly why, but there's a lot of insect and wildlife channels who are demonetized. I'm not sure why that is. But I think YouTube has a different vision for their platform. But the only reason that you are seeing this video today is because I as a YouTuber, I am dependent on donations. And you guys have been good to me. You've been supporting this channel quite well. I think right now I receive about $300 a month from my loyal fans who want to keep this show going. And I am trying my hardest for you to run the show. But it's truly difficult at times. And the bigger this channel gets, uh, the more people who will support me, I hope. And the bigger the things are that I am able to do. Right now it's not enough to do it full time, but that's okay, I have other jobs as well. Uh, I'm in the butterfly and moth breeding business. I have some small jobs with entomology. But it would be cool if somebody, my YouTube channel, had a big budget. I don't do it to make profits. But imagine the things we could do. We could travel, we could film them in the wild, we do, could do big breeding projects, we could even do conservation projects. But uh, conservation projects, they don't come cheap. They're not easy to do. I also want to say, hey, I understand, these are difficult times, okay? Nobody is obliged to financially contribute to my content. I appreciate all of my fans and viewers, even those who may not be in the financial situation to help out, that's completely fine. I understand these are difficult times. We live in a difficult world, don't we? <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I really just need to put it out there. It feels for me always so kind of embarrassing to end a good video with internet bagging. I hate that I have to do this. But the truth is, every time I upload a video, there's a small chance that new people are watching it who just discovered my channel and who are not aware of this problem, right? So uh, I understand that for my long-term fans and followers, it, it, it could be annoying 
to have to listen to this message all over again every time every time I make a big video like this um, but I'm so sorry it's important for the survival of my content I have a dream and that dream is doing something big for the animals that I care about and as much as I am complimenting myself here I do like to believe I am making a positive impact how many other people are there that are figureheads of animals like butterflies and moths I mean there's a lot of people who work in conservation of butterflies and moths but there's not a lot of people who do it on such a platform basis I think it's good to have a face attached to movements like these think of people like Steve Irwin I don't want to compare myself to Steve Irwin he was a great guy he accomplished many things I'm just a small small boy with a camera on the social media I'm not a Steve Irwin but things like that are my inspiration because I don't think he wanted the attention for himself he wanted the attention to direct it to the animals that he cared about and I, I share this philosophy I trying to get attention online not because I think I am that so that's such an interesting person but because I want to take this attention and pinpoint it to the issues that I that bother me really and I, I am bothered right quite frequently it's scary it's scary to be someone who works with wildlife it's scary to be someone who cares about insects in a world where they are de constantly declining disappearing every day I'm reading bad news about the Amazon forest burning down about I don't know civil wars instability uh, poverty in African countries which is also a problem for the environment people cutting down the forest making plantations and it feels like all the things I love and care about are constantly being abused and that sucks it sucks to be someone who loves nature in a world like the one today it hurts and I just want to fight for it and my only way of doing this is through YouTube and through social media even if it means I have to beg for it even if it means I have to turn to strangers to support me and my show financially I also want to say I do a lot of work outside of YouTube uh, YouTube is not the only thing I do uh, I'm not going to explain everything just take a look of, look of my channel and you'll see some of the things I've done uh, so if you support me and my channel if you crowdfund me if you donate and you're not only supporting me as a video maker you're also supporting me as an independent entomologist and my work with insect <laughs> and I think that's it for today uh, you get the point it's been long enough I really hope you enjoyed the video I'm preparing many more for you but it takes a lot of time and work it can take a lot of time for me to upload a video like this all right but thank you for watching and I'll see you next time bye bye preview and now a little preview of things that I am working on if you are patient then maybe just maybe we will see them in the future on my channel it could take a long time before they are finished though bye bye the credits and now for the credits now as I explained before my internet show is not supported by YouTube I am permanently and completely demonetized and my videos do not make any money at all however that never stopped me from making them videos like these take almost one year to produce the life cycle of the moth that you just witnessed I was raising it since October and the video was only finished right now in July that's crazy right for something I gain very very little from videos like these take almost one year to produce for very little views and the only reason that I can do this is because I have over 70 sponsors who donate to my channel while I am not doing YouTube to become rich 
It is impossible for me to do so much work without financial aid. If this channel is important to you, consider contributing financially to the show. Without the support of my fans, it is not possible for me to continue to make videos like this one. And therefore, we will show you some credits. In the credits, you will see the names of everyone who is subscribed to my crowdfunding platform Patreon. And these are the people that make videos like this one possible. So let their names not be forgotten and neither their kindness. Thank you, my dear fans and sponsors, for allowing my channel to exist and grow bigger. I am happy to find out there are still people who care about insects and that want to support independent entomologists such as, such as I myself. Let's begin the credits. Did you like this episode? I sure hope so, because this was very good content. Never before on YouTube will you see someone for the first time revealing a life cycle of an insect that wasn't very properly documented before. Thanks for the support and viewership and me and all the insects. Thank you for your attention. We thank you for the positivity and the support. Are there any other in African insects that you would like to see? Well, maybe you'll see them on my channel someday. Because of my collaboration with this great conservation project in Cameroon, there's a chance we're going to see many more cool species. Bye-bye.